All right, so I'll be here presenting on the multi-engine airplanes, right? But as stated here on the first screen, this is not a flight school. So any, any professional advice should be seen from a flight, official flight training center, okay? So the first main thing is a recap of the last lesson where they spoke on runways and taxiway markings. So can anyone in this chat um, describe to me what these three markings are that I have on the screen? Someone could unmute their mic. Don't be shy, guys. Even if you get it wrong, I mean, still. No one wants to give it a shot? Wait, repeat, repeat the question. Uh, does anyone want to? Like, tell us what these three markings are that I have on the screen, these three separate markings, uh, what, what they are, what they represent. All right, so the one, I'm gonna try. <laughs> um, the one on the far right is a whole short line. Um, the middle one is the ILS whole short line, I think that's what it's called. And I'm not sure what the other one is. The white one, it could be a drive lane, I'm not sure. I don't know what, that, I don't think I've ever seen that one before. Yeah, you got it right. The one on the far oh. right is the whole shot. The one, okay. the one in the middle, the highest critical area, and the one on the left is the. It's a designated area for vehicles to maneuver along the, the ramp. Okay, cool. Well, I've seen it. I've seen one that looks like it at Manly, but I don't think it looks exactly like that. I guess everybody paint yeah. theirs according it's to. look the same across the board. All right, so before I even get into it, does anyone want to unmute their mic and like tell me what they think a multi engineer plane is? Anyone? Can you repeat the question? Uh, does anyone have a definition for a multi engineer plane? Like, what do you think it is? Uh, so get into it. A multi-engine airplane is basically an airplane with more than one engine, right? So the main differences between a multi and a single engine airplane is it's capable of flying as fast as speed and at higher altitude. So when you add another engine to the airplane, you really hope that you can go a bit faster. So it's capable of going faster. It's usually larger in size because they're, they're accommodated for more complex systems in that airplane. So usually multi-engine airplanes, they're never just, never really just throttle and mixture. They're always a complex airplane, which includes a manifold pressure gauge and a manifold pressure gauge and a prop prop lever, or they're either FADIC, which is full authority digital digital engine control system. And it is more demand on the pilots to have additional knowledge of the condition that's supposed to be operating with one engine operating. So basically, the whole point of the multi engine training usually boils down to flying the airplane with one engine. What happens when you lose an engine and how to maneuver it with one engine. So the multi-engine airplane, when operating a multi-engine airplane with one engine in operating, the penalties for a loss of engine can affect both your climb performance and your direction and control of that airplane, right? So when you lose an engine, you, you clearly lost one. So you'd say, oh, I have like 50% of power left. That is true, but you lose 80 to 90% of your climb performance. So for example, let's say we are climbing at 1,000 feet per minute and I should experience an engine failure then that may go down to 100 or 200 feet per minute. So that's how big of a drop off it is when you lose one engine. And your directional control, you, you lose a lot of directional control because you're going to have something called asymmetrical thrust, which is basically just thrust from one engine that wants to bring you into the other engine, wants to yaw and roll you towards that, that inoperative engine. That's what we call asymmetrical thrust. So that will always be a factor when you lose an engine. And this is, we're going to learn how to counteract for the asymmetrical thrusts. All right, so right here on the screen, I just have a chart from uh, PA44, just showing you uh, how do we calculate, basically, our, our climb rate with one engine operating. So basically, we do this before 
that every time before we take off, because it has variables depending on the temperature and like density of the air, stuff like that. This, this will tell us in advance like well, what, what we can expect from a climb rate if we should lose an engine, right? So I'm gonna show you how we would use this chart. All right, so right here I have the same chart. I'm gonna show you how we use it to get our single engine climb rate if we should lose an engine. So usually when you climb out, it'll be like a thousand feet per minute. So now I'm just gonna come here and let's grab 20 degrees, 20 degrees Celsius. And let's say we're about sea level. We're just gonna go straight across and let's say we're about 3,700 feet, and from 3,700 pounds, because these lines right here signify the weight of the airplane. So we're at about 3,700 pounds, and we're coming straight down, and you can see our climb rate if we should lose an engine would be around 220 feet per minute, right? which is a significant jump off from the 1,000 feet per minute that we usually be shooting for. Right, do you understand? Yeah, we get it. Yeah, is there any question? All right, no? All right, so this condition I have on the screen, can everyone see the screen? Yeah, yeah I can see the screen. Yeah. yeah, I can see the screen. All right, so this condition that we have on the screen is called zero side slip, right? It's just basically, what it really is just a maneuver that when you lose that engine, all, you do, all it does is reduce the drag on the airplane. How we do that is just establishing a bank two to three, four or five degrees into the operative engine and basically step on the rudder of that operative engine. So we call it um, two to three degrees of bank and ball half split towards that operative engine. All it does is just aligns the airplane with the relative wind, right? To keep it, to keep directional control over that airplane even though you lost an engine, right? Anyone have any questions on that? All right, so I figure that should be a good explanation on that. All right, so we'll get into the critical engine. So can anyone like tell me what they think a crit the critical engine might be on an airplane, right? You have two, you have an airplane with two engines. What do you think might be the critical engine? What do you think is that this term means? Well, I think the critical engine is basically the engine which is like the lifeline which provides basically electrical power to the aircraft or actually pressure. Uh, it's kind of a far off answer. Anyone else? The critical engine is the left engine. Mm, that's, a, that's, a, that's usually a true statement, but um, <laughs> like, like it, 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 anyone understands like what a critical engine might be? Can I take a guess? Yeah. It's the engine that if it were to fail would have the most detrimental effect on the aircraft. Yeah, basically. So yeah, the critical engine is just the engine where if you lose that engine, it will mostly affect the handling characteristics of the airplane. So it will mostly affect how you fly that airplane if you should lose that engine. That's what a critical engine is. So now you probably be thinking like, hey, you know, how does it matter? Like, why does it matter which one you lose? Like, why does one have more of an effect than the other? All right, so I'll get into that. But first I want to speak about, you have two types of multi-engine planes. You have conventional and non-conventional airplanes, right? So a conventional is, think of a propeller, a prop airplane, is what I'm really speaking about mainly. Okay, so this refers to more prop airplanes. A conventional one is where both props spin in the same direction, which is usually a clockwise movement. So both of them are spinning in the same direction versus the non-conventional one, both spinning opposite direction, which is usually towards the fuselage of the airplane. All right, is that understood? So, so with the critical engine, like I'm going to show you how, how you can identify a critical engine because someone does say that the critical engine is the left engine, but it's it's that is true, but I'm going to show you like why and the factors that lead to that conclusion of the left engine being the most critical. So basically these factors is what makes the left engine the most critical. The the P factor, accelerated slipstream, spiraling strips, slipstream, and torque effect. So now everyone might be wondering, like, hey, you know, what is this? Well, I'm going to explain it. I'm going to explain it by drawing. Hopefully, you guys can have a better picture and understand it 
a lot better when I draw it. So P pop is basically propeller fucker, right? So it's basically when there's a downward portion of the blade, it's taking like a bigger chunk of ear, you should say. So when it's it's creating more thrust from the, the right portion of the blade than what than the upward the ascending blade, right? So first I'm going to draw two airplanes for you guys. I'm going to represent my little airplanes like that. Right? Can everyone see the screen, right? Yes, we can. All right. So I'm just going to, yeah, so we have two airplanes right here. I'm going to signify, I'm going to use an X to signify that, hey, we lost a critical engine. Or, yeah, we lost an engine. So I'm going to use an X to signify and we have one working, right? Because the whole point of this, we're trying to prove which engine is critical. So we got a working right. engine. <laughs> All right. So yeah, so we got uh, we got one on the left and one an airplane on the right. So what I want to put in the asymmetrical thrust, right? Because I'm trying to prove which engine in here is critical because it, you, someone just said the left, but why is it the left? So we got asymmetrical thrust coming from each engine. And what asymmetrical thrust is, as I said before, it's just basically that tendency for the operative engine to want to yaw or roll the plane towards the inoperative one because you know it's un way unbalanced thrust. And from the inoperative engine, even though it may still be spinning in a prop airplane, it's not helping us. It's just creating drag. Right? So we can just represent a little arrow and put a B and just say drag. So P factor is really a yawing tendency, right? So what happens is when the downward portion of the blade the propeller factor, the downward portion is creating like a more thrust than the ascending portion. So basically you have more thrust coming from the downward part because remember, remember this airplane, so both are spinning uh, clockwise. Can everyone hear me? You're fading away. Are you hearing? Yeah, I'm hearing it better than with back. All right, good. Yeah. So basically, the downward portion of the blade is creating more uh, thrust than the upward portion. So basically, your center of thrust is going to be towards the downward portion. And you're going to have less thrust coming from the upward side of the blade. Right? Understood? So basically, your center of thrust, and I'm going to put in a little circle here to represent the center of gravity of the airplane, right? So your center of thrust, and I'm going to compare it to the center of gravity of the airplane on both. Because remember that these are conventional airplanes, so they're spinning clockwise. Right? So your center of thrust is right here on the left, compared to the center of gravity right there. So what you can notice from both of these diagrams right here is that the arm between the center of thrust and the center of gravity of the airplane, with the airplane on the left, it is much, you have a bigger arm, right? You have a greater arm. Right? So and when you have a greater arm, you're also going to have a greater moment, which is basically just a turning tendency towards that uh, inoperative engine. Because that, that center of thrust is so far out, uh, further out than if you should lose the left engine, you have a greater moment, more of a turning tendency, adding to your asymmetrical thrust of the, that wants to bring you to the inoperative engine. So you have a greater moment. This is for the airplane on the left. Right? So when you have a greater moment, then you're going to have greater asymmetrical thrust, more of a turning tendency. So therefore, it's going to be hard to control the airplane. So you have more force, or I can put in brackets here, more asymmetrical thrust wanting to bring you into that inoperative engine. Versus if you use the, the right engine, right? Let's, the, on the diagram on the right here shows that the left engine is working. All right? So you have that center of thrust, but it, that, that center of gravity and the center of thrust, the arm is a lot smaller. Right? So you have a much less arm, a much less arm on the diagram on the right between the center of thrust of the, air, of the operative engine and the center of gravity of the plane. So when your arm is much less, your moment is going to be a lot less possible. Right? So you have less of a tendency for the airplane to want to turn into the inoperative engine. So when you have less of a tendency, you're going to have less of a force acting with that asymmetrical thrust to bring you into that inoperative engine. Right? So it's going to be also a lot less a lot less of force. So this kind of proves 
why the leptin is most critical because you have much less of a turning tendency towards the inoperative engine versus if you should lose that left one. Does this make sense to anyone? Anyone lost? Well, all is well. Yeah, everyone good? Yeah, I'm good. All right, so that was the P factor, right? So now I'm going to talk, yeah. All right, so now I'm going to talk a bit about the accelerated slipstream. So basically, what it is, you wouldn't even have accelerated slipstream without the P factor. But this accelerated slipstream is very similar, but it's more of a rolling, a rolling tendency of the airplane. So I'm going to draw the airplane just a little bit different. Again, two airplanes again, um, signifying uh, two engine failures here. All right, so again, on, on the airplane, you're going to have drag from the engine that is not working, right? And remember that these are conventional airplanes, so they're both spinning clockwise. So you're, the downward force of the blade is going to create technically more thrust than the ascending, ascending blade. So you're going to have your thrust a lot higher on the downward side, right? And again, you have your asymmetrical thrust. It always goes into, into the direction of the inoperative engine. So because all right, so because you have your center of thrust that is further away from the center of gravity of the airplane or the airplane on the left, right? Basically, when you create thrust from your engine, it also inadvertently creates a lift over the wing. So technically we can switch the thrust to be your center of lift. Is going to be a lot further away from the center of gravity and the airplane, creating more of a rolling tendency for the airplane to want to roll towards the inoperative engine versus the airplane on the right, where your center of lift would be a lot closer to the center of gravity and the airplane. So you have much less of a rolling tendency towards the inoperative engine, right? So this is why your left engine is critical because it has much less of, of an effect when if you should lose the, the right engine. Does this make sense to anyone? The accelerated slipstream? Yeah? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, does anyone have any input so far? No one? All right, so let's move on to spiral and slipstream. So again, it's just another diagram showcasing two airplanes because I'm trying to prove why the left engine is critical because one thing to just say, hey, left engine is critical, but that there's reasons why I'm, I'm here trying to show that. So basically, again, two, two airplanes, right? Again, one where the left engine is failed, one where the right engine is failed. We always have drag from the engine that isn't working and we always have asymmetrical thrust. Can anyone tell me what asymmetrical thrust is? No? Any answers for asymmetrical thrust? Uh, Demar, would you like to jump in and explain what is, uh, tell what is asymmetrical thrust? Yeah, so uh, asymmetric thrust, just think about it. Like I like to simplify things a lot because in an airplane, things are, are happening very, very quickly. So all you want to think about is say you're pulling on something, right? And you're pulling with more force on one side, that is going to come towards you a lot quicker. So with the airplane, when you lose an engine, the side that is working is going to want to pull away from the airplane. So asymmetric thrust is, ju is just that. It's, it's that tendency to want to pull away. So everything that we learn in multi-engine flying is how to counteract that pulling tendency. Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah, that's a good explanation. So yes. like for, for me, this is all good. Um, and I think you're doing a great job, but I just, I like to just dumb it down just a little bit, um, just, just to make it super simplistic because <laughs> you know, you lose an engine in an airplane, you don't have that much time to think. I like to think of it dead foot, dead engine, right? So yeah, that's what it is. When, when, you're, when you're flying an airplane, you lose thrust, you realize you lose thrust on that side, 
that foot on the rudder shouldn't be doing anything. And that's how you're going to counteract um, that, uh, the, the, the asymmetric, the pulling tendency. Um, a lot of what we're talking about as well with respect to um, getting that two to five degrees um, up or raising the dead, another tendency or another thing that I like to say, raising the dead engine. Think about that in your slow climbing phase. When, once you get to altitude, a lot of these effects and you're going faster, a lot of these effects are not as drastic. But when you're trying to climb, get to a, a good altitude, to so a good safe altitude, these are some of the things that you have to use to contract. I'm not trying to take away anything from the presentation. Hopefully that's all useful information. Awesome. Yeah, Thank was, you so much, really Sorry, Zach, problem. but we have a question in the chat from Howard. What about art of feathering when you lose an engine? Uh, well, we get we'll get we'll get into that. When it, all right, when when you lose the engine, that would that I will explain more that when it comes to the VMC. But basically, when you lose an engine, um, it's something we call prop wind milling. So even though the engine is not producing power, the prop will still be spinning. And how you get it to stop spinning is you have to feather that engine, basically aligning that prop with the relative wind, right? So that's that's basically what we do. Because when the engine, the, when the prop is wind milling, it just produces a lot of drag on the airplane. So to get rid of that drag, which is really not helping you, you need to feather the prop and to stop it from spinning. And you get a lot more performance on the airplane with that single working. Yeah, yeah. Is that a good, good answer? Yeah. And he said it was a great explanation. So the pink age, you can unmute the mic and speak. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. as it relates to, okay, um, I'm, I'm just a private pilot, so correct me if I'm wrong. As it relates to like feathering the engine, like somebody who I was flying with was telling me that you have to be careful when you go to feather, especially if you're in an emergency situation because you could feather the wrong one by accident. And in terms of yeah. if that were to happen, like what, how would you react or how would you respond to that if you were to the wrong engine? Basically there's like, when you lose an engine, there's a series of steps that we, that we go through, right? Because you really don't want to feather the wrong engine. So it's like, it goes like this, where you identify, so you need to identify what engine you lost first, because as I said, both are gonna be spinning. So visually, you wouldn't be able to like, pick it out immediately. But as as the, the pilot I was just speaking a while ago said, uh, dead for dead engine. So firstly, we would immediately go full throttles on everything, just to, it's a part of the procedure, full throttle, full, full props and full mixture, right? But then you don't want to identify it, so you'd be like dead foot, dead engine, and then you need to verify with the throttle. So when you ver when you bring that throttle back and you feel no performance decrease, then you can have a good idea and be like, hey, you know, I lost that left engine. You know, so from there, you need to secure that engine. So you would bring the throttle, you bring the throttle back and feather that prop. So before you even feather the prop, you need to identify and almost be sure that, hey, I lost the left engine or I lost the right engine. So you feather the right prop. You get what I'm saying? Okay, but if you were to feather the wrong one by accident, like what would happen and what would you then do? Well, the thing with feathering, like if you feather a working prop, what it just does is just, it brings a lot of stress on the propeller system because how it works is, it's how the blade angle changes, there's oil in the prop hole. There's oil in the, in the prop. So basically when you bring that blue, that blue lever forward, it introduces more prop and changes the blade angle. And when you bring it, it, it introduces more oil and changes the blade angle. And when you reduce that prop lever, it brings oil out. So if you should feather, uh, um, if you should feather the prop with your engines full, your manifold pressure full, and you bring the, your prop lever all the way back, you can damage that propeller, basically. Even, okay. even sorry, let me yeah. just step in here real quick. Um, even more so critical, like at Air Canada, we have very strict SOPs um, with respect to um, all of this stuff. Like we, when we lose an engine, when we're, say we're on the runway and we lose an engine and, and we're at V1 or greater, we're, we're going flying, but we don't do anything before 400 feet. We just keep flying the airplane. So it is much more critical if you go now to feather an engine and you say you feather the good one, you're losing thrust on that engine. So you've lost an engine and then your working engine, you lose thrust. It could be very detrimental to your flight path. 
So you don't want to feather the wrong engine. It, it's much, it's much more, it, it behooves you to take your time, identify, be methodical in terms of what's happening, what's going on and analyzing before you touch anything. Cause that could be critical in the sense that I don't know if anyone's seen that ATR that took off. Uh, it was somewhere in China and it was flying over a bridge and it crashed into the bridge and it had quite a bit of bank on it. And I think in that situation, they actually shut down the wrong engine. So um, feathering in a working engine is just as, it's probably the same thing as, 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 as losing power, complete power on that engine. So it's very critical. So it's, it's very key to ensure that you do identify because it could be detrimental, especially if you're low to the ground. Yeah, that's a good explanation. I, I have a really question. Well, Jaffa has one minute. Amory has his hand up. Amory, you can unmute and speak. Wait, I, I don't understand what exactly feathering is. All right, so feathering, yeah, feathering is basically aligning the propeller blade with the relative wind, right? Because when you lose an engine, uh, let's say you have your props pulled forward, the engine, even though you lost it and there's no significant power coming from that engine, is still going to be spinning creating a lot of drag on the airplane. So feathering is just basically removing all the oil that is stored in the prop hub to keep that specific blade angle. And you're bringing it out and aligning that blade with the, the relative wind. And this in turn stops the prop from spinning and reducing a lot of drag on the airplane. Does that help you explain it? Okay, thank you, I, I understand. <clears throat> yeah. I have a question. If I were to feather my engine in flight, and I, can I just push it back up or can I push the prop lever back up or what would happen? All right, that's something that we try actually not to do. Uh, we try to never uh, bring, we try to never reduce the prop, the prop lever first. You always reduce your front lever with your manifold pressure mm -hmm. first. That's, that's, just, that's just something we, we always do. We try to keep the props higher than the, than the manifold. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, I understand. But say you accidentally feathered the wrong prop, can I just push the prop lever right back forward or no? There's Is nothing there... that says you can't, but it could damage the engine. So it's, as, 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 as the airline pilot just said, it's best for you to just identify, the... well, make sure that you're feathering the right engine. So there's no need to rush. Just make sure you're feathering the right thing. Mm -hmm. And then you identify the failure of an engine by a loss of manifold of pressure, oil pressure, and stuff like that. Is that what you look at? Well, you can, firstly, you can feel it. Like when you lose an engine, you can immediately feel it in the, the characteristics of the airplane. And as we said with dead foot, dead engine, when you lose an engine, your, your immediate reaction is going to be to maintain directional control of the plane, mm -hmm. right? And you're going to find that in maintaining directional control, you're, you're going to have to press a lot of rudder off the working, off the side of the working engine. So immediately you're going to be like, hey, dead foot, dead engine. So this, my left foot, let's say, I lost the left engine. My left foot won't be doing anything. But my right foot is mm -hmm. having a hard day. You get what I'm saying? So immediately yeah, you know that like, the, left, the left one's out. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. I know this is going off topic, but say you're at cruise and your engine fails. Is there like, you, would you immediately pull out the checklist? Let's say you're already cruising and then you run through that. And if you do, like, what, what are the items on the checklist in like, the seminal that you fly to, to shut down the engine? Okay. Is it like All right, basically, shutdown? yeah, so basically it's a, like this, this way of how we do the checklist is like a do then do, if that makes sense. So basically we memorize the whole thing, we do it, and then after we did it all, we look at the checklist and make sure we didn't miss anything. So how it would really go is, I'm not sure if everyone really understands, but I, I'm going say it from my memories. Throttle pull forward, prop pull forward, um, mixture pull forward. You're going to maintain directional control, so you're going to get that zero side, go into zero side slip condition. And you're going to shoot for your VYSE speed, which is 88 in the seminal. And then there's there's two things now. If you're above 3,000 feet, then you try to troubleshoot. So you're going to be like, hey, I want to try to restart this engine, right? So I'm going to go make sure my fuel selector is on, all taps are open, carpet is off. Make sure your mixture is up, your prop is up, your throttle is forward, and you're going to try to crank and restart the engine. And if that doesn't happen, then you're just going to shut it down. So how you do that? Is you start the process again, and when the fuel selector off, the call flaps go with car beat off, then you start from left to right, you go throttle idle, prop feather, make sure cut off, and you turn off the switches. And that's All just how right. it Yep, I understand. Thank you. Yeah. All right, so spiraling slipstream. 
uh, I guess I'm not sure if there's new people that just came in, but basically we have two, we're comparing two airplanes, one where, one where we lost an engine, but the left one we lost the left engine, the right one we lost the right engine, we're explaining critical engine and why the left one is critical in a prop, in a propeller airplane, right? So over here, we just have drag, that's what the B represents, uh, and the asymmetrical thrust, all right? So we're explaining now spiral in slip street. So basically when your propeller is spinning, it's creating a backward flow of air, where air from lower pressure will always want to go to the air of higher pressure. So the air, the air, the air flow behind the propeller will always tend to vary off to the right. Right? Versus if you should lose the left, if you should lose the right engine with the left one working, that air flow is going to do the same, but it's going to hit the, the rudder, let's say. It's going to hit the rudder and it's going to help with counteracting that asymmetrical thrust. It's going to hit the rudder on the left and forcing, it's going to hit the rudder on the left and forcing that nose of the airplane to counteract the asymmetrical thrust. Right? So this is how um, asymmetrical thrust means the critical engine and why the left one is critical because that spiraling airflow is going to actually help you to bring the nose of that airplane and counteract that asymmetrical thrust and turn in tendency towards the inoperative engine. Is that, does that make sense to anyone? Yes, it does. Yeah? All right, I'm gonna get into the last one and that's torque when it comes to critical engine. Um, Zachary, my um, one question. Um, mm -hmm. Where the it's a case that um both engines fail would it be you would float in inst what would happen in that case if both engines would have failed it's a bad day uh, if you lose both engines like to be honest like from what i've seen with the the light twins at least they're not made to fly they're not made to be flown if both engines fail you know so they don't glide well as the as the single engines would so the procedure there is just to land as soon as possible, like as soon as possible, because there's not much gliding distance with the multi-engine airplanes, but they're a lot heavier. And from what I've seen, they're they aren't made to fly that well as a as a glider. Yeah. Okay. All right, so I'll get into the last one of why is the left engine of critical engine and why left one is critical, which is torque. Right, so I'm just going to draw two airplanes again, same as before. And one left engine is out, and one with the right engine is out. Again, we got the drag, and again, we got asymmetrical thrust on both planes. All right, so basically, with torque, torque is basically saying it refers to Newton's third law where every action has an equal and opposite reaction. So your propeller. Is spinning clockwise. It's a conventional airplane. So your propeller is spinning to the right, which is clockwise. So advertently, you're going to have an equal and opposite reaction, which is torque, which is want to bring the airplane to the left. Right? Same for both, both airplanes. Your propeller is conventional, it's spinning to the right, clockwise. So you're going to have torque that wants to bring you to the left. So why, why the left engine critical in this, in this circumstance is here we can see that we have asymmetrical thrust that wants to bring us into the inoperative engine already just from losing an engine. So we have that asymmetrical thrust that wants to bring us into the inoperative. Plus, we also have another factor that I have here on the screen, which is torque. Torque wants to also bring us into that inoperative engine. So therefore, that increases the total amount of yaw that we're going to have towards the inoperative engine, making it more difficult to control the airplane, right? Versus if on the, the image on the right, where we lost the right engine, the left one is perfectly working, we still have that asymmetrical thrust that wants to bring us to the inoperative, but you can see that the torque effect is, bring, is counteracting that asymmetrical thrust, right? So it wants to bring us the other way, so that, that helps us. And can I ask a question? Yeah. So. So for your saying, Newton's third law, um, but if a propeller spin into the right, it creates an action to the left, right? Yeah. So what would happen if I install counter-rotating props? Would that fix uh, anything? Yeah, so that, 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 that's where the non-conventional airplanes come in, which is what we, we did most of the trading in. So basically, non-conventional is where uh, both props are spinning in opposite direction, usually towards the fuselage of the airplanes. So basically, 
all that means is that when you lose an engine, it doesn't matter which one you lose, they're going to the plane's going to react the same. It's more critical engine than non conventional. Oh. Well, these diagrams are for conventional airplanes and why the left one is critical. So get it? Yeah, so the DA sixty two and things like that are the ones that have counter rotating props, right? Yeah, I'm not sure what the DA sixty two has, to be honest. <laughs> well the newer <laughs> ones. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but that's that's not how it works. The fans. So, yeah, so with these four explanations, the P-factor, accelerated substitute, spiral substitute, and torque effect, this is why the left engine is so critical, mm -hmm. right? So does everyone understand? Get a good understanding, more of an insight as to why critical engine, why it's critical. Yeah. Oh. I understand. All right. Right, so now we're getting into some performance and limitations. So does anyone have any questions before I move on any further? Or any more questions? Doesn't sound so. All right, so I'm gonna speak a little bit on accelerate and stop accelerate and go distance, right? So these are things that you'd like to calculate before you go flying. So this is the and stop distance, but basically the length of runway that you're going to need in an airplane in order to reach your, your rotation speed or your liftoff speed and bring the airplane to a complete stop on that runway, right? There's no regulation by the FAA that's saying that hey, you must have at least, you know, accelerate and stop distance of runway for you to take off out of it. But it's a good practice to know that I have enough runway that if I should experience a failure, I can bring the airplane to a stop. And the accelerate and go is the same thing but you get your rotation speed is basically the distance required to get to 50 feet with losing an engine at your rotation speed. Understood? Yeah. Okay. So the next one here, I have a graph showing how we calculate the accelerate and stop distance. So I'm going to show you how we do that real fast. For every flight, let's say we use 20 degrees Celsius and we're at sea level, right? And let's say our plane weighs, we're maximum, we're being 3,800 pounds, and we just go straight across on this line right here. And let's say we also have no wind, so we're just going straight across again. So as you can see, we get roughly 3,000 feet. So 3,000 feet of runway is what we would need to accelerate from our stopping position, get to our rotation speed experience an engine failure and bring it to a complete stop. Does everyone understand? Okay, any input? Go for that one more time, please. I, I missed it. All right. Uh, right. So I'll do it one more time. All right, so basically we're getting our accelerate and stop distance. The amount of distance the airplane needs to, to, from a stopping position, accelerate, reach your rotation speed, and then experience an engine failure and come to a complete stop, right? So we're calculating that distance uh, right now using this chart in front of us. So we're just taking some random variables, 20 degrees Celsius, and uh, let's say we're at sea level. And now we're just going to bring this line across onto the weight of the airplane. Let's say we're very heavy, which would be this line right here. So we're 3,800 uh, pounds. So we're just gonna bring this line straight across again. And let's say we also have no wind, but this side over here, this is the wind comp compartment. Let's say we have no wind, so we're just going straight across. So as you can see, we have roughly 2,900 feet of runway that we would need in order to achieve accelerate and stop distance. So distance needed to get the rotation speed and complete comp and complete stop. Yeah, everyone understand now? If there was wind, could you, could you show an example of there was wind? Oh, yeah. All right, thank you. All right, so I'm going to do it a little bit different. Uh, let's go 15 degrees Celsius and sea level. Okay, and let's say we are 3,500 pounds. So I'm just going to bring this line down to 3,500. And then I'm going to go straight across stop right here so he wanted a wind so let's say we have 10 knots of headwind so i'm going to bring my line down to just about 10 knots and then go straight across so what you realize is that that distance is now cut to 2,000 feet 
So we, we just cut off 900 feet. So what happened is, because I introduced uh, 10 knots of headwind and the temperature is a bit lower, the variables change completely. You understand? Yes, I, I do. And the headwind will help you to slow down, right, no, sir? The, yes, the headwind will help you to slow down a lot. So it use up less runway, hence a thousand foot difference, right? Yeah. All right, so now that we right. covered that, that's, that's that, how we... Go ahead. The, headwind, the headwind will help you to slow down? Yes, the headwind helps to slow down generally, because generally in overall, the airplane always takes off into the wind. Yeah. One, it helps you to get airborne um, in a shorter distance, and two, it helps you to slow down by aerodynamic drag. On the airplane. Oh, I see. I see. Yeah. All right. Okay, so I'll just explain you guys that chart. And now I'm going to get into the service ceiling, right? Because now we're flying. We have two engines. So we have an all engine service ceiling. So basically, what that is is just um, the altitude where the airplane can maintain 100 feet per minute climb at full power, right? And you have an absolute ceiling. So there's a difference between your service and your absolute ceiling. The absolute ceiling is where the plane can't go no higher, it stops right there. And the service ceiling is where it can only maintain 100 feet per minute. But because we're flying multi, we also need to know something very um, important, which is our single engine service ceiling. So basically, that's the highest altitude where the plane can maintain 50 feet per minute of climb at full power on a single engine with the other engine feathered. Why the other engine has to be feathered, as I said before, it reduces the drag on, that air, on, the, on the airplane. So it gives more performance to, the, to that single engine that's working, right? So the service, this single engine service ceiling is something that's really important and something you really need to calculate uh, before you go flying. Because let's say we have an engine failure, right? We're flying at 10,000 feet and we get an engine failure on one engine. The airplane is going to sink down to that single engine uh, service, service ceiling. That's, that's what's going to happen. It's not going to maintain 10,000 feet if you lose an engine. It's going to gradually go down to that single engine service ceiling. And the absolute ceiling where the plane can is no longer climb anymore with one engine and the other prop pedal. So I'm going to show you how we calculate it using this chart. So let me show you guys right here. This is, if you, if you notice, it's the same chart I used before with the one engine operating uh, chart. So in order to get our single engine service ceiling, we're going to use the chart, but we're going to use the chart backwards. So our single engine service ceiling is where we can only achieve 50 feet per minute, right? I hope you guys remember that part. So what happens is we're going to look for 50 feet per minute right here. And then we're going to look next for the weight of the airplane, which is, let's assume that variable to be 3,700 pounds. So I just want to draw this line straight up. It's about 3,700 pounds right there. And then we're going to make a diagonal line over here on the left. Uh, let's say the temperature is 20 degrees. So we're going to make a diagonal line. Let's match in that one. And then we're going to connect these lines. Right? So right here, what I can see, this would be my single engine uh, surface ceiling, which looks to me to be like 4,500 feet. So basically, if I'm flying at 10,000 feet and I get an engine failure, my plane's coming down to 4,500 feet in order to maintain uh, constant altitude, let's say the highest altitude. Does everyone understand? Yeah. Can you go over that for me, please? All right. No problem. Uh, All right, so basically, to get our single engine service ceiling, which is the altitude where we can only climb 50 feet per minute, we're just going to look, we're reading this chart from right to left. So we're looking for 50 feet per minute over here on the right. Then we're looking for the weight of our airplane, which is about 3,700 pounds, which will be right between 3,600 and 3,800. So we're just gonna bring this line up to about somewhere in between these two uh, lines. Then we're going to draw a diagonal line. Let's say our, the temperature outside is 20 degrees. So we draw a diagonal line uh, parallel to the, the, the black line that's already there. And then we're just going to try to connect these two lines as straight as possible. And this will give us our single engine uh, service ceiling where these two lines meet 
like here, that would be just the service ceiling of us, the single engine. You understand? Oh, okay, cool. Understood. All right, so as you can see, this is, a, this is something you need to calculate and know before so that when you're going to fly and you can know where you know, the airplane might come down to you because you have an engine failure at the high, high altitude. Wait, so if you are at that height and one of your engines fails, you can still climb? Uh, actually, yeah, you can still climb, achieving no more than 50 feet per minute. And eventually, the airplane will get to its, to its absolute ceiling where it can no longer climb. Okay, thank you. So, so if so, if you're at your absolute ceiling, and then the engine fails, um, and then one engine fails, it will go to the single engine absolute ceiling. Uh, yeah, technically. But it, but it not, but it won't go to the service ceiling. It will, it will technically go down between the service ceiling and the absolute ceiling because there's not much difference in between the two. There's no direct chart to calculate the absolute ceiling, but that's 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 where it will usually come down. Right, so oh, yeah. Oh, Christian. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, question. Um, with the absolute service ceiling, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so you can't climb anymore. So I, is the airplane at a is it more prone to stall? Because I assume if you can't climb anymore and you pitch up, there's more drag on the aircraft. What would happen? Yeah, the start, uh, the start speed will increase. Okay. So yeah, yeah, answering your question simply, yeah, it'd be more more prone. All right, thanks. Any other question? I have another question. I have one more. I have one more. It is it's for further back. Presented. I don't know if you're going to go to wires this but I see you, you lose the, the engine, right? One of the engines. That you yes. have full rudder deflection. Suppose you had a crosswind coming from 90 degrees the airplane. What would happen? Because you don't really have much rudder to play with in that scenario. Okay, yeah. That's a, it's going to be very difficult to control. I've actually had that before. It's very difficult to control it. But it can be done, but it's just very difficult. All right, cool. All right, so now we're going to V speeds, right? So I have a little chart here showing the different air speeds, uh, showing an airspeed indicator. So now what I want you guys to like uh, help me with is to identify the different air speeds that are on uh, this, Can I this go? right here. Can I so go? off of the airspeed indicator, uh, yeah, let me just label it first. So where this white arc ends, right? Uh, what's this red line right there? And what's this where this green arc starts? I want someone to like help me and tell me what these three speeds are, where this white arc ends, the red line, and this beginning of the green. I'll do the blue line. <laughs> All right, yeah. VYSC, single engine rate, best single engine rate of flight. All right, so the blue blue line is VYSC. Yeah, and the, the red line, line. The red line, BMC. Uh, which one of the red lines? All right, so the, the red line on the right, the lower one, is the v, VMC speed. All right, anyone else? Anyone else? Anyone knows the airspeed indicator? The white arc is a flap extension arc or speed or something like that. You can only yes. put on flaps if you're operating in that arc. Yes, yeah, so that's what the white arc is for. So the end of the white arc shows the VFE, the flap extension speed. Uh, any, any, anyone else? The green, one. Put, you know, uh, the green yeah. one is the VNO, the normal operating speed. Uh, the green one to the left? Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's your VNO. So I'll just put in one right here. This one is your. Oh, and then the, v, the green one to the right. Um, I think I'm, I'd say they're VSO or VSE. I don't know. Right. Uh, this is V. Yeah, this is your VS1. So this guy is your star speed in, oh. in your in landing configuration. And no, this is your star speed in clean configuration. And this one, your VS, is your star speed in landing configuration. Wait, I'm right. confused. What's the difference between that and VSO and VS? Yeah, the same. 
So the, the ending of the green arc is basically your stall speed in landing configuration. So basically with flaps and gear, right? And the ending of the, the white arc, right? The VS is basically your stall speed. I, I, remember, flaps I know, but I remember seeing that uh, listed as VSO for um, stall. Yeah, I mean, are they interchangeable? Yeah. So that would be your VSO, and then VS1 would be the VSC, because that's what I hear. Yeah, VS1 and VSO, and your the, the red line to the left, the last um, indication is your never exceed speed. Okay. Um, what's about the, the yellow arc? Isn't that the um? The yellow arc. That way you can operate the, the plane safely in smooth air or something like that. Yeah, so that's yeah, that's what it is. So basically, the ending of the green arc is your VNO, which is your uh, speed, normal operating speed. That's the end of normal speed. So basically, you can only operate in this yellow arc when you're going to smooth air, let's say. Right? Right, cool. So this leads me into another thing that I hear to talk about. And that is VMC. Can everyone hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. All right. So does anyone know what VMC is? I want to make a guess as what VMC is. Can I guess or no? Visual meteorological conditions. That's the VMC you're talking about? Uh, yes, that's a, it's a good answer, but that's not the VMC I'm speaking about. This is the VMC. We're talking about VMC as it relates to speed. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Can Anyone be capital else? V subscript MC. Yeah, I know. I made that mistake. Should, should, can I go or no? Because we went through. Yeah, anyone wants to try what VMC is? Good. It's the. Yeah, it's that thing. single engine climb. Uh, right, so VMC is basically the lowest speed where you can maintain directional control of the airplane with the critical engine inoperative. I can you can simplify it even more. Just uh, V speed MC minimum control. So the yeah, minimum, minimum control. control. Right. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right, so VMC, it's basically, as you can see, it's right there as a red line, but it's not always that number, let's say. There's a lot of factors that affect um, what your VMC might be, might be on a specific day. So I will get into that and to show you guys the different factors as to what um, varies at VMC speed. So standard day, maximum allowable such available power, our center of gravity, critical engine windmilling, flaps and gear up, so up to five degrees a bank and most unfavorable weight. So right here, it looks like a lot. It's an acronym we call a smart form. And this is what determines if our VMC is higher or lower on a specific condition. You understood? All right, so I'm gonna explain it. Uh, I'm going to my notes. So again, I'm gonna be drawing two airplanes uh, one, well, both signifying the critical engine inoperative, because that's what we're trying to prove here. So the first one is going to be a standard day, right? So who can tell me what is a standard day in aviation? Say that question again. Uh, who can tell me what is standard day in aviation? Right? What is a standard day? Is it the 15 degrees yeah. in temperature and the 2992 in the altimeter? Yeah, so it's 15 degrees Celsius and 2992 inches of mercury, right? So I'm, I'm going to come to you your say 1013. You guys are from Jamaica. <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah, yeah <laughs> but I'm going to say what we forget about 1013 hectopascals. <laughs> 1013.2 hectopascals, right? Like, That's a Versus a non, I'm going to compare two airplanes, so non standard. I said okay. So let's say it's a 30 degree day. 
and three zero one one inches of mercury or uh what is this uh 10 18 maybe picks up i'm not sure on that all right so i'm comparing two airplanes i'm going to draw them right here all right so one we're both signifying that the critical engine is inoperative so as we had in the earlier joints we're going to have drag from the inoperative engine and asymmetrical thrust Standard day. So basically, on a standard day, what happens to the density of the air? It is going to be more dense, right? You're going to have a lower density altitude. So let's put that in. We're going to have more dense air on a standard day. So the molecules are going to be closer packed together versus the, the, the right condition where 30 degrees Celsius. The air is much more warm, so the particles are going to be a lot more spread apart. So the air is going to be a lot dense, on a lot less dense on a non standard day. All right, so we can put, you know, less dense for the non-standard. So when you have a more dense air, it is directly opposite where the density altitude is going to be a lot, it's going to be less. And when you have a low density altitude, it is good for the performance of the airplane, that the engine performs a lot better when your density altitude is lower, right? So you have more performance. So because we're having more performance from the airplane, basically it's going to be hard to control. I'm going to need to use more rudder in order to counteract that asymmetrical trust that wants to bring me into that inoperative engine, right? So more performance, less control because more power. So when I'm getting more uh, performance on the engine, I'm going to need to do more correction. I'm going to need to use more rudder in order to counteract for that more performance on the engine. So because I'm using more rudder, I'm going to have less available as I lose airspeed, right? So because I have less rudder available, the faster your feet, the rudder is going to be finished than if we're having a non-standard day. So I'm going to have a higher VMC speed on a standard day versus if it was a 30, 30 degree day, it was a lot um, less dense air, higher density altitude, your engine is not producing as much performance. So you're going to have less performance on the engine. And because you have less performance on the engine, you're going to not need to use as much rudder to counteract that um operative engine so your vmc speed is going to be less because they're going to have a lot more rudder available to work with as you lose air speed does this make sense yes yeah everyone everyone understanding for the most part Anyone wants to put in any input, any question so far? Demar, you have any inputs? No, see, you know, it's good. Um, no, it's good. I, I won't take away anything from that. Um, are you going to break down BMC anymore? Like, are you going to talk about BMCA, BMCG, or are you just keeping it BMC? No, yeah, I'm just keeping it BMC. Like, okay. Yeah. And just explaining the factors as to what changes, you know, make it go up and down. Okay. Yeah. No, that's fine. Uh, yeah. No, no inputs on that. All right. So the next, the next factor that affects your VMC speed is your maximum allowable or slash available power. Why is it different? Because some airplanes you cannot um, directly go full power. So you have to go up to a certain uh, throttle setting. Versus some airplanes you can just go full power. Right, so I'm going to show you two examples again, two airplanes again. Okay, right. we lost the critical engine on both. All right, and again, we have the drag, and we got asymmetrical thrust. I hope that I know everyone should know what asymmetrical thrust is. Okay, so basically, we're comparing maximum allowable and available power. So this airplane on the left, I'm going to say has a hundred percent power. I'm using full power. And the airplane on the right, let's say I'm using 60% of the power of the airplane, right? So because I'm using more power with the airplane on the left, it's similar to the first one that I just explained before. I'm getting more performance from the engine that is working. So that's adding to the asymmetrical thrust, making it more difficult for, for me to control the airplane. So more performance. More performance on the engine, right? So it's you have less control of the airplane because they're going to need to use more rudder 
to counteract for that more performance from the engine. So you have less rudder available to use. So as you bleed up airspeed and you need to use more rudder, the faster the rudder is going to be finished, right? So we have less control of the airplane. So we have less control of the airplane. This is always direct and opposite to VMC. We're always going to have a higher VMC when you have less control. Because of the rudder availability, we have to use more rudder to counteract for the higher performance. So your VMC speed is going to be higher. Versus if we were to use a lower throttle setting, like say 60% of the power, then clearly we have less power, right? So less performance. And we have less performance. I don't need to use as much rudder to keep directional control of the airplane. So therefore, I have a lot more rudder available. So as I bleed airspeed, my leg can travel further with that rudder pedal. Basically, it's going to take a lot longer for that rudder to be finished because there's a lot more available. So my VMC speed it is going to be higher with less power setting, 60%. Does everyone understand? I'll, I'll just input here. Um, I used to fly the uh, C-130J Hercules uh, in the Canadian military. And what you're talking about here with power, we had so much thrust on all of our engines that when we did lose an outboard engine, we actually had something called APCS, which, uh, decreased power on the other outboard working engine to help with VMC, uh, VMC A in that, in that respect. And the A portion just means air. Um, and we also had rudder boost. So it's a hydraulic uh, controlled airplane uh, with the flight controls. So when we had flaps set uh, to 50%, um, we had rudder boost. So we had more rudder uh, authority with the flaps down. So it was critical that we were, we'd schedule when we retract our flaps so we had more rudder boost until we could get to a faster speed um, so that we had more controllability. So all that stuff that you're saying with respect to power, rudder availability, all plays into VMCA. The, the bigger airplanes make things a little bit easier for you though, just to, um, to, to control the aircraft with you know hydro, hydraulically boosted controls and whatnot. Yeah, it's a good input. So does everyone understood what what was said here and what Demar just said? Yeah. Right, so we're gonna do the next one. The, the, I remember the acronym is SMAC from so we're at A, which means off C G, right? So this this is related now to the center of gravity of the airplane. So again. Same diagrams, just comparing two airplanes with the critical engine lost. We have the coming from the inoperative, and we have that asymmetrical thrust. Once again, to the inoperative engine. All right, so basically, at FCG, we're going to put the center of gravity. So I'm going to put one where the center of gravity is a rearward in the airplane, which we call F, right here. And we're going to put a forward center of gravity on the one on the right. So we're comparing how does this affect the VMC speed, right? So basically, you have the rudder right here. And I'm going to draw a line, let's say, connecting the rudder to the center of gravity. This line represents the arm between the center of gravity and uh, the vertical um, tailplane of the, of the airplane, where the rudder is. So basically, right here, you can see that there's not much of an arm between the center of gravity and the rudder. So we're just going to put uh, less arm, right? So when you have less arm, I'm going to introduce um, less moment because moment is a turning tendency, uh, just a really a turning tendency, right? So when you have a less of an arm, you're going to also have less moment. So less of a turning tendency to, um, you know, to, to help with the airplane, let's, let's just say, I'm trying to simplify it as much as possible here. So basically, when you have that RCG, the rudder, you have to use a lot more less rudder. Less pivoting. To yeah, less pivoting, a uh, simpler, simpler, simpler way to say it. Yeah, so when you have the up center of gravity, then you're going to have, uh, you're going to need to use a lot more rudder to counteract for that, that asymmetrical thrust coming from one injury operating, right? So you have, lot, you have less rudder available, right? So you're going, to, you're going to need to use more rudder. And when you need to use more rudder, it, it becomes the same across all. When you need to use more rudder, you have less control of the airplane. Why? You have a lot, you have a lot less rudder available. 
So in, as, the, as the airspeed builds up, the more rudder you're going to have to use and the faster you'll be out of rudder. So basically you have less control of the airplane. And as it always is, it's always directly opposite. So if you have less control of the airplane in that way, you're going to have a higher VMC speed. Versus if you have a forward CG, then this arm between the center of gravity and the, the, the rudder is a, lot, is a lot further. So you have a greater arm and you have a greater moment. Oh, a better way to put arm and moment, think of a door, right? So as you always see with every door, the hinge is on one side and the, the, the knob is on the other side. Why is that so? Because trying to open a door with one finger from the hinge, it's gonna be a lot harder to open than if you were to open it from the other side. You're gonna need a lot more force, right? So this is why a forward CG and having a greater arm is easier on the pilot to control the airplane, right? So we're, gonna, we're not going to need as much rudder because we have more control. So we're going to have a lot more rudder available here, right? So we have more control and we're going, to, we're going to need to use less rudder. So as I always said, it's always opposite. So if I have more control of the airplane, in the airspeed, the VMC is going to be a lot less. We're going to have a lower VMC speed. I, re I really like that explanation. That was, that was good. That was really good. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone, everyone understand? Yeah. How I, how I like to do it, instead of saying more rudder use, mm -hmm. for this one, I prefer to say how, how, um, how effective the rudder is. Yeah, okay. So I would say yeah. for the greater VMC, you have less rudder control mm -hmm. instead of saying more rudder because then it can become a bit confusing. Yeah, so basically, yeah, so as you say, with the FCG, you're going, to, you're going to have more rudder effectiveness, as you want to put it, right? You're going to have less rudder effectiveness. Less rudder so effectiveness. Before, yeah, yeah. Your, your VMC is going to be higher because the availability of the rudder like just to keep the plane directionally controlled, you're not going to have as much available as you would when you have a forward CG. Yeah. So that's simple, that's simple. And so let's move on. We're here now at critical engine wind, wind milling. Right. So again, same thing. Two airplanes. One critical engine is out. Critical engine out. We got drag again. Drag again. Asymmetrical thrust. Oh. All right. So now critical engine windmilling, right? So this this is where they were speaking about the feathering of the prop and why we need to do it and all of that. So this airplane on the left signifies a windmilling prop. So let me write that somewhere here. Wind milling. And the one on the right is signifying a feathered prop. Hey, what, what exactly does windmilling mean? It means it's still spinning. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right, so one on the left, windmilling, one on the right, uh, feathered. So basically, with a windmilling prop, it's going to, let me, let me actually draw something here to exaggerate what I'm trying to say. I'm going to make this drag line a lot longer. So with a windmilling prop, you have much more drag coming from the inoperative engine because even though the, the inoperative engine is still spinning, it's not helping you. It's just creating a lot of drag, making it hard to control the airplane. So you have more drag coming from that windmilling propeller. So when you have more drag, it's harder to control that airplane. So you're going to need to use more rudder in order to control that airplane, right? So you're going to, you're going to have less rudder effectiveness and you're going to have less rudder available in order to control the airplane, right? So you're going to need to use more rudder, right? So as I said before, you have less control because it's creating more drag in the same direction of the asymmetrical thrust. So you have less control of the airplane, right? And because you have less control, as you said, it's always opposite. Your VMC speed is going to be higher. Okay, versus a feathered propeller where we take all the oil from the prop hole back into the, the oil sump, right? So this aligns the prop blade with the relative wind, stopping it from spinning. This, this reduces drag significantly on the airplane. So less drag, right? We're going to have a better time controlling the airplane, more control of the airplane. So we're going to need to use less rudder. So you're going to have more rudder effectiveness and more rudder available in order to control the airplane. So you're going to 
less rudder, more rudder available. So if I have more control of the airplane, then directly opposite again, we're going to have a lower VMC speed. Does everyone understand what windmilling versus pedal prop? Yeah. Yeah. Alright, cool. Um, can I ask a question? Yeah. What is really the ideal situation with VMC? Do you want a lower VMC or a higher VMC? Yeah, yeah you always want a lower VMC, right? Yeah, yeah okay. you want a lower VMC. Because remember, okay. that's, that's a speed where you can maintain, maintain direction control of the airplane. So what, the lower okay. that speed is, the better. Because if it's higher, you can, you know, you can be a bad day at a faster speed versus okay. having okay. more room. Okay. All right. So let's go into flap. Yeah. All right. So let's go into flaps. So this one, the same two airplanes again, but I'm going to draw them a little bit differently. Right. But same. Critical engine is out. Right. Got drag again. And we got asymmetrical thrust. And then we got drag and asymmetrical thrust. This one I'm comparing uh, flaps down versus flaps up. So I'm going to put a little bit of flap right under, under the, the right image. So flaps down, let me just write that. All right, so basically when you don't have, when you have flaps up, the engine is prop propelling, so it's creating thrust, right? So you're going to need to use uh, more rudder or you're going to have less rudder effectiveness because the airflow is just moving smoothly under the wings, so to say, right? Because there's no drag coming from the operative engine, but there's drag coming from the inoperative side. So therefore you're going to have a less, <clears throat> less rudder effectiveness in order to control that airplane. So you're going to need to use more rudder and you're going to have less control. And as I always say, with, when you have less control, you're always going to have a higher VMC speed versus on this one, we have drag, the same as this one coming from the inoperative side. But because of the flaps, it introduces drag also to the side where the engine is working, right? So what, what happens here is that because you have drag coming from the side where the inoperative engine, where the operative engine is working, it reduces that asymmetrical thrust. It helps to reduce it a bit. So therefore, you have more rudder effectiveness. You have to use less rudder to control the airplane when, when, when you have the flaps down. So you need to use less rudder. And when you have less rudder and more rudder effectiveness, then your control of the airplane is going to be a lot greater. And opposite again, your VMC speed is going to be less. Understood? I believe this is the one where drag is helpful in an engine failure situation, eh? Is right, that flaps okay? up to inch Yeah, uh, you're, you're, hearing, you're hearing me? Yeah, hearing you now. Yeah, the, the flaps it help to introduce drag on the side where the, the engine is operating versus if you have the flaps up where there is not much drag coming from that side. So it helps to, to counteract that asymmetrical thrust, yeah. which lowers the VMC speed. Wait, can yeah. you control which side? Can you control the flaps independently or do both flaps have to go down? Uh, from every airplane I've seen, both flaps work. Con yeah, you don't, you don't, you don't want split flaps. That's a very bad thing. Yeah. But wouldn't it help if there's engine failure? Because then you can, you can increase the drag on one side and not on the other. That's what your ailerons are for. Okay. All right, so I'm going to get into up to five degrees of bank. So basically I'm going to draw two airplanes again. One that is straight and level and one that's turning. We have asymmetrical thrust. And with the one on the right now, it's going to be split up. So when the plane is turning, can anyone tell me some of the components that act on the airplane in a turn? Can I go? You said forces in a turn? Yeah, you can Cent just... Centripetal and centrifugal forces in that turn. Um, what am I looking Horizontal for? Horizontal component of lift. Horizontal component of lift. 
Yeah. Horizontal, vertical, and weight. Adverse, yeah. Adverse, yeah, happens when in a turn as well. All right. All right, so we're looking for mainly three things. The vertical component of lift. So vertical component of lift. Well, the total lift, which is acting in the, the direction of the turn. So we're going to put TL for total lift. And the one in the direction of the turn is a horizontal component of lift. Right? So basically, with this one, it is, it is beneficial in a turn with your VMC speed that the, the airplane under, is everyone hearing me? Yeah. Yes. All right, so this guy, all right, so with the airplane turning on the right, basically we have, because of that horizontal component of lift, it helps to counteract that asymmetrical thrust, right? So because we have this horizontal component of lift, it helps to counteract this asymmetrical thrust that wants to bring us into the inoperative engine. So when that is helping to counteract and basically helping us, we, we have more rudder effectiveness, right? We don't need to use as much rudder in, in the turn in order to keep the directional control of the airplane. So I can just put here less rudder necessary, right? So when you we, when we have more rudder effectiveness, we have a lot more rudder available to use. And more control. Right? So, we're going, so we have more control. And what comes directly opposite? Lower VMC. Yeah, we have a lower VMC speed versus if we were which turning, is we, which is yeah, which is good. So if we're not turning, then we we have none of none of these forces, right? So basically, our VMC speed is just going to be higher because we have no horizontal, no horizontal component of lift helping us to counter an asymmetrical thrust. So we're going to have to use more rudder, and it's going to be uh, less less effective, more less control of the airplane. You understand? I'm confused. You said there's no horizontal component of lift? Uh, because the plane's not turning. So for a plane straight and level, you won't have no horizontal component of lift. So that will not so that will not help to counteract that asymmetrical thrust. So because oh. we don't have any horizontal component of lift, we have less rudder we have less uh, rudder availability in controlling the airplane. Right? So we have less control and we're going to have a higher VMC speed. You understand? Oh. Yeah. All right. Any questions? Wait, so I have a question. Um, so is yes. that why you do, um, what is it, zero slipping? Oh, I forgot what it was. Uh, zero side slip? Yeah, zero side slip is. Uh, what was the question? Like, what do you do? You, what, you do that, is it to introduce a horizontal component of lift by doing that side, side slip? Well, or mainly the zero, the zero side slip is just to um, maintain directional control of the airplane, really. So, it, because when an engine fails, we have three tendencies, a pitch down, a roll towards the inoperative, and a yaw towards the inoperative engine. So doing the zero side slip, it helps to align the airplane with the relative wind and keep directional control over the airplane. Oh, okay. So how, how does that affect how, how the airplane behaves? Uh, I don't understand the question. So uh, I, I'd assume that when you when you do a slip, you you'll be causing more drag um, on the on the aircraft. So would that make it harder to, for example, maintain altitude or stuff like that? What what are the, the different tendencies when of the, of the aircraft when you enter a, what you call it a zero a zero side slip? Yeah. So basically, with the zero. All right, with the zero side slip, basically what happens, we're flying straight and level, and then we lose an engine. What's going to happen is, whichever engine is working versus not working, the one that is working is going to want to roll and yaw towards the inoperative one, right? So if you do not introduce the zero side slip condition, you're going to always have to be, you're not going to maintain directional control of the airplane. You're going to always need to put in control, control efforts to keep the plane going where you want it, basically. So in order to counteract this, this this roll this roll and yaw movement you you need to put in the zero side slip condition which is two to three or four to five degrees a bank and ball half split or just basically step on the rudder to where the directional control is being maintained. You understand? I don't know if I answered the question. Yeah man, yeah man, I got you. All right, so 
this is the last one that affects VMC and it's called most unfavorable way. So it's, it's, it's literally like the same thing as before, but this one is just comparing two airplanes of different weights and same critical engine out, one engine working and asymmetric thrust. Let's say I have a 3000, that's a bad three pound airplane. And on the right, I have a 6,000 pound airplane. So the same forces that come in again, we have the component of lift. We have the total lift, which acts in the direction of the turn. And we have the horizontal component of lift. And the same on both sides. All right. So basically what happens here is obviously you have two different weights of airplane, right? So because the heavier airplane is well, obviously heavier, it's going to have greater forces. So basically all of these forces are going to be, and these are different colors, they're going to be exaggerated. So you're going to have greater forces. So technically we're going to have a greater horizontal component of lift in a heavier airplane than a lighter airplane, right? So I can state the obvious and put, all right, less horizontal component of lift, a more horizontal component of lift. But as I stated before, the horizontal component of lift help to counteract the asymmetrical thrust, right? So if I have more horizontal component of lift in a heavier airplane, then I'm going to have more control over that airplane. I'm going to need to use less rudder or have more rudder available during this turn, right? So I'm going to put less rudder. And versus in a light airplane, I have less horizontal component of lift. So I'm not going to have as much control. I'm going to need to use more rudder in order to counteract for uh, that asymmetrical thrust. So if I need to use more rudder and have less available, I'm going to have less control over the airplane. And less control always advertently means I'm going to have a higher VMC speed. Versus if I have a heavier airplane, greater horizontal component of lift that helps to counteract the asymmetrical thrust. I'm going to have more control right, and a lower VMC speed. So that's basically. I have a question. Somebody just asked a question. Oh yeah, I have a question. Um, you said, um, so the heavier you are in a, in a bank, there would be more, it's that there is more horizontal lift, which adds to the, which, what does it do to the rudder force? I don't think we're hearing you, Zach. I think I can answer that question in the meanwhile until Zachary. Zachary's right. mic is back up hard. You're there, Zachary? Yeah, but for most unfavorable weight, you're really thinking about how stable the aircraft is going to be and how that stability affects your VMC speed. Mm -hmm. So with more weight that is introduced, it is it then allows the aircraft to become more stable. And with that stability, it decreases your VMC speed because the more stable it is, the more control you have over the aircraft. Oh, I see. Uh, anyone here, everyone here now? Yeah, we hear you. Did that uh, kind of answer your question? Yeah, it did, thank you so much. Uh, uh, where, where did the slide, where did it stop um, hearing? Where did it stop working? It was under, you're on the questions, you switched to the questions. Oh, okay. Yeah, so that, yeah, that was basically the end of the VMC and like how it affects, how, what factors affect it increasing and decreasing. And yeah, that brings to the, the questions, like is there any questions that, that's basically at the end what they have to present on multi-engine?
So if you guys have any questions um, for Zach, um, this is where you can ask. Well, somebody asked a question, Zachary, and I kind of answered it. I don't know if you have anything else to add. Oh, uh, that's in the chat. asking, yeah, Jeff was, was asking. You can ask him again if you need more clarification. Yeah, I was just asking about, um, on the last thing about unfavorable weight, I believe it was, about the horizontal component of lift. And can you elaborate that on that a bit more? So what, from what I heard, the more weight you have, the more stable your aircraft is? Uh, not really. It's just, basically, it's just about the horizontal component. And basically, when you have more horizontal component of lift, it helps to counteract the asymmetrical thrust. So obviously, on a heavier airplane, they're going to have heavier forces. Mm -hmm. So if I, have, if I compare a lighter airplane to a heavier one, the horizontal component of lift is going to be greater in a heavier airplane. So that helps to, that helps to reduce your VMC. You understand? Oh, and is this, and then would this be factored into the zero side slip? So like when you're in the zero side slip, you'd have more horizontal components of lift in that, and that yeah. affect the VMC? Yeah, and would it, it, do, it does factor. Or would it also be the lift from like the vertical stabilizer and things like that too or no? Uh, I, I, what do you say? Uh, never mind, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> Just ask, the, right. just ask the question, man. Don't be shy. Uh, I was talking about, would the vertical stabilizer have anything to do with that, too? The, li um, the lift produced from uh, that? No. Okay. All right, so, if there's any other questions? All right, so, um, if there is no other questions, um, we'd like to, to thank Zachary for this very detailed presentation. I enjoyed it very much. I learned some stuff that um, I didn't know before and I relearned some stuff that I should remember, but I didn't remember. So thanks for, so much for this um, presentation. Um, thanks so much for joining everyone. You know, thanks for taking the time out from your schedule to you know, Come on board and see what we're doing here at the Aeronautical Club of the West Indies. Um, special thanks to um, Demar Walker for lending his expertise to us um, over and over again. You know, since we've been having these meetings, you know, we appreciate it very much. Um, special thanks to our two um, ATC personnel from MBJ, Allison. McIntosh and Jody Young. Um, you guys should say hello to tomorrow when he's flying in again. Um, so thanks for you guys um, for joining in. Um, we have a survey we'd like you guys to we'd like you guys to complete. The link will be in our the chat right here, and so would the links for our other social media accounts. You know, to just join. Um, do the survey, let us see how best we can improve on what we're doing here. And um, So the link is posted here. And thanks again for joining us. Thanks to Zavi, or Zavi, I don't remember how to pronounce your name, Zavi, for the inputs also. You know, we're learning a lot here, and that is why we are here at this club. And also remember that um, we're not, what we're presenting is not in a form of a flight institution or a flight school. You know, it's just for general knowledge, a club, club settings. All right, so again, thanks for joining. Enjoy the rest of the day, guys. Can I say something real quick before you yes. guys go? Yes. Um, yeah, no, you know, it's, it's been, it's been uh, great being able to join these meetings. I must say, I, I really do admire the professionalism of the group as well as the presentations. Um, very detailed. Uh, very well thought out and very well presented. Um, I mean, if you continue down this path, I, I'm, you're, you're teaching me stuff too. And again, I'm reviewing stuff that I haven't seen in years. I fly, I fly an Airbus, right? So, I mean, how do I deal with side slip? I, I, I align the beta target on, on a takeoff when we lose the engine. So, um, you know, it's nice to see the detail, high level, uh, of detail and if you continue down this path I mean everyone has a, a very very bright future in aviation so really nice to see and uh, just keep up the good work yeah, thank you
All right. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. And Hardy, even though he's, he left already, thanks to him. Also, he was helping us out with some questions in the chat. So, again, everyone, enjoy the rest of your day.